Good morning and welcome to today's mission status briefing. With us are Gary Horlocker, the STS-134 lead flight director, who's just coming off his Orbit 1 shift, his final shift of the mission, and Heather Hankel, Hankel, the principal investigator of the storm test, which was concluded today. Gary, would you begin, please? Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, absolutely outstanding day today so far. Um, I think the probably the word I'd use to sum it up is uh, pretty much flawless. We obviously undocked today from the space station, um, pretty much undocked right on time. And as we talked yesterday, uh, the pilot, Greg Johnson, was at the controls. He backed Endeavor away from uh, the station out to about 400 feet. And then he initiated the full lap fly around. And uh, so we did the fly around, got our standard photos of the entire outside of the space station. We also took a few photos, uh, specific photos of the ATV vehicle as requested by our colleagues across uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, once the fly around was complete, the crew started the uh, storm trajectory, take care of the storm DTO for today. Um, all those burns went perfectly as planned. Uh, the trajectory was, was right on the money and uh, everything just went really, really well. And, and Heather's going to give you more details about how the, the sensor performance went, so, so we can hang on to that for a few minutes. Um, so we got all that accomplished, and uh, so once we, we got outside the range of the sensors, we started shifting gears towards uh, thinking about coming home. The crew got right into the, uh, the water dumps that we always have right after we get undocked, and uh, those were in progress as I left the control center. Um, then they'll be also working on getting the cabin in the right configuration and start configuring the ship uh, as a re-entry vehicle. So, so like I said, things so far went really, really great today. Um, we did have one little distraction during the uh, storm trajectory shortly after SEP2. Uh, the crew got a fuel cell message on board, fuel cell delta volt message. and. Uh, so basically, the, the orbiter has three fuel cells. That's how we generate power for the, for the entire vehicle. And uh, each of those fuel cells has 96 cells within it. And those are broken down into three separate sub-stacks. So there's uh, 32 cells within a sub-stack. And, and the fuel cell has a cell performance monitor attached to it. And with this, it's a very small black electronic box strictly to monitor the performance of the fuel cell. And it basically takes each of those sub-stacks and, and looks at half of it, 16 cells at a time. So it compares the, the voltage across both of those halves of the, the stack of 16 cells each. And so ideally you want that, you expect that voltage, uh, delta volts between the two halves to be zero in an ideal world, but obviously, you know, it's gonna be a very small number in, in the real world. And uh, if that delta, delta volt value uh, climbs to a certain point, it starts, it's an indication that the uh, fuel cell is degrading and you're starting to have some issues with the fuel cell. So that's, that's basically the, the purpose of the cell performance monitor, the CPM box. So it exceeded that, that limit. It performs that test every seven and a half minutes. Um, it, it exceeded that limit, tripped the message, crew got it. We, we uh, were looking at the fuel cell performance in real time. We had no other indications of any problems. The fuel cell was performing great. Uh, so we just kept an eye on it. Next time it ran the self-test, it, it turned out nominal. And so basically it was kind of intermittent throughout the storm trajectory. Uh, I think we had seven, seven uh, self-test failures throughout the last few hours. Um, and then in between each, each of the other uh, self-tests were just, just nominal. So, so it's kind of an intermittent uh, indication that we're seeing, but again, the, the fuel cell is performing absolutely perfectly the way it has all flight. Uh, we have no concerns about, about its actual performance. We think it's really just a, an issue with this performance monitor box. So um, it's very similar to a signature we saw on STS 130 last time Endeavour flew. It was actually an indication on a different sub stack in the same fuel cell, and after that flight, they replaced this uh, CPM box, a performance monitoring box. So. So it's a very interesting, um, but again, the fuel cell looks like it's, it's working fine, so the team's gonna be you know, continuing to watch it and talking about it throughout the day. So um, I think that's really all I got to add. I'll hand it over to Heather to give you the details on how the storm activity went today. Thanks, Gary. Uh, the storm team had a great night tonight. Uh, we were able to get VNS data throughout the entire undock, re-rendezvous and final separation trajectory, 
The software performed flawlessly. Drew Foistel put us into all the right modes right on schedule. We had no anomalies, and we're real excited about uh, getting a lot more VNS data. Uh, we've accumulated throughout Rendezvous and including today nearly 600 gigabytes of data. So we have a lot of good data analysis days coming ahead of us once we get the boxes off the vehicle in Florida and the team will start working together to analyze all that data. So from a ground perspective during real time, we get to see data over the sequential still video. So we don't get all the detailed data that I showed yesterday, which had some, I guess, uh, detailed plots of some of the performance of the VNS. So what we get to see is one snap every 30 seconds versus the, uh, I guess, 30 times per second that the laser's actually firing. And uh, we do calculate a range estimate based on that. And that looked really great. We compared it against TCS in close and out further against the shuttle state vector. And that matched really well. We're very happy with what we saw. It looks again like we've exceeded our five kilometer um, goal. So that was very exciting. Uh, we were lots of smiles and cheers. We had nice words from Drew at the end of the mission. And uh, the storm team has done phenomenally. We were throwing a curveball the other day with our um, docking camera data recorder. Did not come up today as we were all kind of crossing our fingers it might initialize correctly. So there was no new docking camera data to, to collect today. Uh, but we did get our primary objective on the Orion MPCV-like trajectory for the re-rendezvous. It was flown exactly per design. And we believe we will have met uh, those objectives. We do have all the docking camera data collected from Rendezvous safely stored on the data recorders. So that should be no problem when we get it back. And i uh, just like to thank the wonderful STORM team from Johnson Space Center, from Langley Research Center, from Ball Aerospace, and from Lockheed Martin. It was a fantastic group of folks, a lot of talent, and a pleasure to have worked with everybody for the last few years. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Gary. Uh, we'll start with questions now. Uh, first here in Houston. Uh, if you'd step to the microphone once you're recognized, please remember to say your name and your affiliation. Bill? Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, how uh, were you able to, how, how far out were you able to maintain a uh, lock on the station uh, going out and then coming back? So again, it's a little difficult to tell, especially on the way out, it happens to be a part of space station that has no visible reflectors on there. So data was showing that, that uh, the laser was likely shooting and timing out for most of that area. But again, we are only getting one frame every 30 seconds. And once we get all the data back on the ground, we'll have the 30 hertz data. And we believe we'll see some intermittent um, acquisition of the space station during that time but without any visible reflectors when you start getting out at ranges that far, we'll have to kind of see what uh, happened with it and how it performed. Again, one of our objectives for the VNS getting flown is what is the reflectivity of the space station like in this wavelength versus uh, when you do and do not have reflectors visible in the field of view. And I, I'll just go ahead and add to that. You know, the, the outbound trajectory was really designed to set up the inbound trajectory to meet their prime objective. And, uh, you know, of course, station did reconfigure to, to get some power generation during that time frame as well. So it wasn't optimized for the, uh, the uh, storm reflectors for that phase. So. And then on uh, when do you expect to get your data and, and your hardware back? Uh, yeah, so we've kind of been told by KSC, return to Florida plus about a week. We will get to get back in the vehicle and perform a post-flight um, test. We'll just fire everything up and do a return to Earth great, just like we expected to. Then we'll get the, the uh, sensors and the data recorder package will get moved over to a, another facility at KSC, and that will start our data retrieval. If we pulled 24 hours a day, we would get everything off in six days. So then we'll have that um, 600 gigabytes of data passed on to all the analysts to go have their fun. Additional questions, Robert? Uh, 
Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, to follow up on that question for Heather, uh, what's the end product? What do you um, what do you have at the end of all the an um, all, after all the analysis is done? Is it an animation of the approach, um, individual stills? What's what are we going to see um, when everything's ready? So I think we'll see all of that. Um, and from a usability of all of that, what will happen is the Orion MPCV program will take in all of this data and utilize the lessons learned, the per actual performance we saw for Space Station to update any of the models of the VNS that they use on the ground with those models that they feed into the relative nav system and then into the overall guidance, navigation, and control. They'll be able to very accurately design around that for performance of the vehicle, for all their mission planning, and the data will go ahead and also prove for the docking camera perspective uh, the situational awareness that the crew will use for flying out angular misalignments and such, just as the shuttle crew does today. Okay, thanks. And, and for Gary, um, realizing that the, the CPM uh, intermittent failure is not a huge concern at this point, if it did become more of a concern, what are your options uh, in, in, as opposed to just ignoring it? Yeah, so the CPM is, in simplistic terms, is just telemetry on uh, how, how the fuel cells perform. And so, so if that box were to fail completely, you know, what we're also talking about doing is setting up the uh, fuel cell monitoring system, FCMS. And that's basically just an uh, application on the onboard laptop that ties into the uh, vehicle data system. And it, it'll give us the next layer of insight. We can go down and look at the, each cell level in the fuel cell and look at each cell separately, which we can't do um, at the CPM level. So it'd be the next step in, in data gathering, if you will. But again, all the, all the data coming from the fuel cell and that, that we watch in real time as it's, as it's running is, is, again, looking great. OK, additional questions here in Houston? Uh, seeing none, we'll go to the phone bridge. Uh, Marsha? Yes, hi, good morning. Um, Gary, I have a couple questions for you. The first being, I heard you and Mark Kelly discussing potentially wind, windy weather here at uh, Kennedy Space Center on Wednesday morning. Could you fill us in on what the latest weather update might be? Sure, Marsha. I know the uh, the last forecast I saw was was pretty old, and and of course you know Florida is what it is until you're just about to either launch or land there. So, you know, I'm not too excited about it yet. But the forecast was. Um, um, outside the flight rule limits for the, for the crosswinds. Um, I know we were looking at the data actually coming off the, the runways um, just an hour or two ago, and, and there, it was actually fairly calm. So um, again, you know, until, until we get a little bit closer, I'm, I'm not too excited about that uh, forecast. Thank you. And, and could you also reflect for a moment on the fact that this is Endeavour's final journey into space and that there is only one more shuttle mission left before it all ends? Sure, you know, um, it's a long, long time coming. Uh, the, it's been an incredible program. Um, you know, I've been focused on making sure we, we get this mission accomplished as fairly aggressive from the beginning and uh, a pretty long mission, and, and we, we, we met every objective, got everything accomplished. So, you know, right now I'm just going to take a deep breath and, and enjoy the fact that uh, we've gotten through the 99% of the mission. All we got to do is get uh, the crew and the ship home now. So. Um, you know, I think it will be bittersweet seeing it on the runway here, hopefully in two days. Um, and then we got Atlantis uh, rolling out that same night to the launch pad, and then uh, one last flight for the program. So, uh, so it's kind of sad to see it ending, but it's uh, it's time to move on to the next chapter. Thank you, Bill Harwood. Yeah, a quick one for Gary. Uh, just uh, just based on your nav data, how far? How far back did you guys fall off, and how far did you come up before the before it stalled out? Oh, the uh, trajectory. You're asking about trajectory distance. Um, I believe we got we got right around twenty nine thousand feet, which was what we were targeting on the outbound uh, part of the trajectory, and then um, you know coming up in in close to station after we did the TPI burn, which puts you uh, on target for your your final point just below the the space station targeting 1,000 feet below and 300 feet behind. Um, we, were, we got to about 950 feet from the space station, and uh, the trajectory stalled out. Crew did not have to do any braking pulses whatsoever. And, uh, and then we just fell away and did SEP-3. So again, the trajectory was, was right on the money almost the whole way tonight. It was, it was, it was really, really outstanding. And, and one more quick one for me, and maybe this is for Heather. What is the advantage 
of, I guess, what do you call this, a co-elliptic approach versus a, an R-bar or a V-bar approach? What, what is the advantage of that, if there is one, or is it just a different, different way of doing things? Thanks. Sure. So it is a different way of doing things. And as a matter of fact, once you're past that either stable orbit rendezvous, like the shuttle performs, or a co-elliptic, the trajectory beyond that looks pretty similar as far as flying around to the V-bar and then approaching along the positive V-bar to the station for docking. So there's a couple of differences. Uh, one, you get on a trajectory that's a delta height below the trajectory of the space station. So you could just kind of stay in that orbit. It's a safe orbit. It's a non-collision. And you can kind of approach from below. And then you just make some burns to close that delta height. And then you could come up right below on the R-bar and then fly around to the V-bar. So I know uh, back in the days when they were designing the shuttle trajectory, uh, they, they did not have that cross feed for the reaction control system jets. And, and it kind of ruled out any kind of an approach like this. It just, just the types of burns that it would require. So with a new vehicle for the Orion, it was able to kind of open back up that trade space. And, and this was the trajectory they picked. It's a good fuel efficient trajectory and a good safe trajectory. Okay, uh, Stephen Clark. Hi, right, just uh, one more question. I'm wondering if uh, this is Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Uh, just a quick question on cost. I'm wondering if you've had a chance to go over the cost since uh, the question yesterday uh, of the cost of the storm experiment. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we, we've been pretty focused. Um, since we had our DRU-3 failure, uh, we were pretty much working around the clock to get new procedures up to Drew. He had to take several different actions to get things powered down. So uh, I was not able to follow up with the project on getting those final cost numbers for you. But uh, and as the principal investigator, I was sort of responsible for the technical success of the experiment. So I didn't have those numbers readily available. Um, I'm sure in the days to come, we'll be able to close the loop on that. And you might be able to follow up with the Orion project for a better number. Thanks. James Dean. Hi, thank you, James Dean, with Florida Today. Gary, uh, I know we have uh, additional briefings to come, but just because the, the timing is a little awkward, wondered if you could say any more about the uh, preliminary uh, plan for, for entry, um, if, uh, if it would be right to assume that only KSC will be active uh, Wednesday morning, I guess, and um, the next day would be your, your landing day if need be. Yeah, the, um, the entry flight director and the uh, program will be discussing that, you know, throughout the uh, morning, this morning actually, laying out the strategy and, and uh, picking the strategy. But uh, I would suspect that, that the, first, the first night will probably be KSC only, and, and uh, if for whatever reason we can't get uh, landing that first day, that second day we'll have uh, KSC and Edwards. But again, they'll be discussing that here uh, this morning and coming up with the final strategy. Thank you. Okay, I believe that's it for the phone bridge. Do we have additional questions here in Houston? Seeing none, we'll wrap up the briefing. Uh, you can follow the progress of the STS-134 mission of Endeavour and uh, activities on the International Space Station at www.nasa.gov. Thank you for coming.